All right. So let's assign roles for the on-camera workshop, which will be on the 14th. Mike, do you still want to be the uh, VP of Annuity Processing and Sales? Sure. Okay. All right. Head of Annuity Processing? Ricky. Yes. Uh, project Manager, Online Entry Project. We can come back to it. All right. We'll come back to it. Uh, head of Annuity Sales? To VP of Information Technology. All right. Who wants to do the Menard draft scenario? All right, Marilyn. Marilyn. Anyone else want to do that? I mean, it's kind of sometimes even a better exercise with two people because they're like, yes, yeah, all right, Jose. All right. Uh, who would like to do an interview? Who would like to be interviewed? Okay, well, we can't, we can't have any interviewers if we don't have any interviewees. I guess we can come back to that one. Uh, who wants to be the, uh, the, uh, the BP chairman? If we have more than one person, we can rock, paper, scissors. Daniel. Fantastic. Uh, reporter for the BP press conference. David, excellent. Anyone else want to be the reporter? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the annuity processing. So if you don't sign up for the annuity processing, you pretty much have to do an interview or an interview E. Project manager. Project manager, Nick. Okay. Head of annuity sales. <laughs> VP of information technology. All right, say you. Say you. All right, we still have the head of annuity sales. This is good. When we have a sales background, even if you don't, sell more stuff. Don't. <coughs> don't worry about processing. Labani? No, that's not. That's not the hand. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So, can someone volunteer for head of annuity sales? Any little kids are talking about uh, Yeah, all right, well, who, who wants to do an interview? Okay, Lavanya wants to be, do an inter, be an interviewee. Lavanya. Lavanya. You want to be interviewer. Okay, so who wants to be an interviewee? All right, renew. All right. Renew. And Lay, you wanted to be an interviewee? Okay, fantastic. Lay, all right, and Lavinia. Lavinia. Let's put Lavinia with Renew. And so you'll read the description, prepare some questions. Lavinia, you'll talk to her, ask her what she wants to be interviewed about, read the questions she prepares, research a little bit, maybe take one little curveball to throw her. Uh, another inter interviewer. Sure, we can give you tips on your interview right. skills. Uh, we'll look mostly at the interviewee. I, I kind of figured. We'll look. <laughs> we could, but yeah, all right, all right. So, but but yeah, we'll make a special effort. You and Lay. All right. So you're going to be an interviewer, Evan. With Lay, okay, so, so work with Lay and figure out the questions. Um, all right, so I think that leaves Jim, head of annuity sales. Um, that's exciting. We had a lot of interest in that one, Jim, but I think I'm going to give it to you because you are the most qualified. <laughs> um, so we're on, on page eight. Your next week you're going to play the uh, head of annuity sales. Not next week, two weeks from tonight. You're going to play the head of annuity sales for the on-camera workshop. Okay, so who does not have a role? Michelle does not have a role. Is that it? Everyone else has a role? I won't be a commissioner. Thank you. I was going to talk to you. Okay, fine. 
All right, who will be here but does not have a role? Just Michelle, I guess? Okay. All right. Looks we're good. And Michelle can be an extra, uh, extra reporter to ask some tough questions. Yeah, we'll talk to her about that. We're gonna have four reporters, whatever. Michelle. Okay, one other detail with that for the annuity processing scenario. Um, Mike, do you have a laptop you can easily bring? Okay, so bring your laptop, and also I'll try to connect with you on Skype sometime between now and then, just so that doesn't become a technical glitch. I'll figure that out during the break or something else. Um, uh, Ricky or Nick, do you have a laptop you could easily bring? Ricky? Okay. Ricky, laptop. And same thing to you. I'll try to connect with you on Skype so we get that out of the way. Uh, and Jim or Saeed, do either of you have a laptop that's easy to bring to you? Saeed? Okay. So Saeed, uh, laptop. All right. So Saeed, Ricky and Mike, you'll bring your laptops. You make sure your Skype account is up to date, and we'll try to connect before class, you know, sometime between now and then. All right, so that's that. Let's begin with emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is one of my favorite topics to teach in this class, and I've also found it to be one of the most valuable. I find I use these emotional intelligence techniques all the time. All the time in my large-scale communication interactions, all the time in my personal relationships. I'm constantly thinking about how I'm getting upset emotionally and how that's negatively affecting my communication skills. Or if I'm able to control those emotions, how it more positively affects my communication skills. So let's get some definitions. What is emotional intelligence? Let me throw this first one out. Emotional intelligence, the ability to use, identify, understand, and manage emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. Sounds pretty good, right? We want to do all of those things. So let's break that definition down. So ability to identify, use, and understand, ability to use. Identify, use, understand, and manage emotions. So, what's going on with your emotions? Are you upset? Is this the right time to have a difficult conversation with your boss? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I should wait till I'm calm. Okay, I'm frustrated at the IT people because they took so long to get here and they asked annoying questions when they came. Should I tell them that right now? Or does it really matter? You know, maybe I should just hold off, take a breath. <coughs> Because every time I call them from now on, they're going to be mad and they're going to be slow to help. So ability to identify, use, and understand and manage these. The positive things that will happen, relieve stress. You know, you're going to be emotional, upset all the time. Typically, that's going to hurt you more than the other people who are making you mad. And communicate effectively. Hard to communicate when you're really frustrated and mad at someone. Empathize with others. What does empathize mean? Putting yourself in their shoes. Yeah, putting yourself in their shoes. So maybe my boss is under a lot of pressure right now. Maybe she's facing some deadline, and that's why she's getting all frustrated and mad at me. So if I were in her shoes, I might feel the same way. Just the process of thinking about that can help you relate better with her. All right, overcome challenges and diffuse conflict. Good stuff. We want to use this in our communication interactions. We want to think about how it's relevant in all levels. If you have high emotional intelligence, you're able to recognize your emotional states and the emotional states of others and engage with people in a way that draws them to you. So two things. Recognize your emotional state and your emotional states of others. This was developed in 1985 by some guy named Leon Payne, but more notably developed by someone called Daniel Goleman who 
ap applied this to business settings. Has anyone heard of Daniel Goleman before? Maybe if you saw, yeah, before you saw the video that I signed you, you've heard of him before? Okay. Okay, yes. So he said, let's think about how these emotional intelligence skills can help us in a business setting. And that's what he did, which was useful for business people who looked at the bottom line, the results that this kind of stuff creates. He said, we are judging job performance here. We're not going to judge any touchy-feely creative stuff. We're going to say, what helps us with job performance? And he looked at various factors, which he grouped into three categories. The first, he said, does IQ help us with effective job performance? Sure, it helps a little bit. If you're really smart, you may be better at your job. But we all know people who are really smart. They're not great managers are not great at their job. So he said, let's also look at job skills. Does someone who, have, who may not be as smart, may not have a high IQ like someone else, but they have really good job skills, they've gone through Navy training and perfected all those skills, is that going to make them a good manager? Is that going to lead to effective job performance? Well, he found that that was more relevant than IQ. But still, he found, especially as managers moved up and got more authority, there was something else that was much more important, and was emotional intelligence. It was this ability to understand your own emotions, understand the emotions of other people, and use that to effectively communicate with them. And not just communicate because we can say we communicate effectively, but communicate so that we can say that we increase job performance. And depending on how we slice the data, Sometimes he said EQ accounts between 60 and 80% of effective job performance. Got a little complicated the way he looked at it, so depends on what level and what sense we mean by effective job performance, but he has some data that says between 60 and 80% of effective job performance comes down to emotional intelligence skills. How can we further subdivide emotional intelligence just so we can get a better idea of this definition? and how it relates to us. Well, Goleman categorized things of, you know, categories, categorized categories of emotional intelligence. I think he had five different categories. I like to group emotional intelligence into three different categories. So I think it's easier to, easier to assess that way. First category, I say, is, emo is self-awareness. Awareness of your emotions. What agitates you? What type of people agitate you? What type of professional situations stress you out? And how does that affect your ability to do your job or your ability to build relationships? Second category, emotional management. So when you're mad, when you're frustrated, how can you manage that and still interact in a professional manner? Third, social management. How can you connect with other people? How can you empathize with them? How well can you understand what's going on in their emotional environment? And how does that affect your ability to build a relationship with them? So, three pillars of emotional intelligence that we will discuss in class. Self-awareness, emotional management, and social management. I'd like to do a quick exercise to put this in context and to get you all thinking about skills, attributes that past managers have had, and what worked and what didn't work, and we're going to see how close that fits into emotional intelligence skills. So we'll do this quick exercise with you thinking about the best manager you've ever had, and you thinking about the worst manager you've ever had. And then I would like you to think about three attributes that this best manager had, and three attributes that this worst manager had. And just, we'll jot those down. I'm going to give you some little stickies to write those on, and we'll do an exercise where we collect all those pieces of data. But for right now, just think of the best manager you've ever had. Think of the worst manager you've ever had. And write down the three attributes of each of those people. And you can, yeah, you can turn to the, the second packet I gave you, the EQ workbook. I think on the first page it has this exercise. You can just start thinking about those, start writing those down.
So we'll keep going, but I'm going to pass out these little stickies, and you should take six of these little stickies and write all six of the adjectives down, or all six of the attributes down on each of one little sticky. So you'll need six total. So take like six and pass them on. So let me get you some more. Just take six, pass on. You don't have to count out exactly. You can take a few more. So you should be writing three attributes of the best. Are you still need stickies? Yeah. All right. Okay. If you have stickies, throw them at me. Oh, two more. Okay. All right. So write down three attributes best. Three attributes for the worst. All right. When you're done with that, I would like you to think about where those attributes fit in terms of are they related to your manager's IQ? Were they related to your manager's job skills? Or were they related to your manager's emotional intelligence? And when you've decided that, I would like you to bring those stickies up to the front of the class and put them in the appropriate place. So your three stickies for the best manager, who's related to IQ, you're gonna stick it right here. Who's related to job skill, you're gonna stick it here. EQ, you're gonna stick it here. Same thing with worst. I, if it's IQ related, here. Job skill here. EQ here.
Okay, so what do we see with the data? It's exactly like Goldman would have predicted it. <laughs> Between 60 to 80 percent of job performance can be accounted for with emotional intelligence. So if we really, really hate someone, it's not as often that we say, well, we hate them because they're stupid or they can't do their job. What really gets us mad about them is that they're illogical, demanding, micromanager, have trust issues, dishonest. Okay, if someone's dishonest, we don't care how well they can do their job or how smart they are. You know, they're dishonest, closed-minded, emotional, insecure, <laughs> indirectly called me a bitch. <laughs> okay. Bad, bad EQ. Sam. <laughs> Same thing with best manager. I, I, I'm even, I'm, I could go with your best manager you've ever had. I could go, I would be, I would believe you more if you told me that it came down to intelligence or job skill. I think you might remember that person is really, really smart or just so good at their job. But at least our data doesn't show that so much. We liked them and we remembered them because they were rational, trusted me, supportive, trusting, transparent, open and support, inspiring. Good listener, good listener, all right, Con uh, grants autonomy, inspiring, available, uh, not afraid to fail, patient. So it's these emotional intelligence qualities that make us remember this person as the best manager we've ever had, and similarly, the worst manager we've ever had. So this is important to our development as we become managers and want to communicate effectively. And we want to be the manager who has all the stickies right here. When your subordinates take this class, you want them to put you right here rather than right here, right? So let's continue trying to break this down a little bit more and think of some specific things that we might have encountered and how they relate to emotional intelligence. Uh, actually, before they, we do that, I'm going to go through each of the three categories, self-awareness, emotional management, social management, and pose the question, what do you have if you have good emotional intelligence, if you have good self-awareness, good social management, good emotional management? What does self-awareness mean? If you have self-awareness, you 
can understand emotions and effects. You understand your emotions when you're mad and how this is going to affect you. And I looked at that printout. I'm sorry about this. It didn't come out on the, the printout. I will, I will double check that next time before I do the print, but sorry that on your slides on the handout it didn't come out, but we'll go through this slowly if necessary. But we won't really need to. Uh, can, if you have self-awareness, you have congruent verbal and nonverbal. What does that mean? Daniel. Okay, okay, yeah. Good, good. That, that, that's a larger definition of congruent verbal, nonverbal. Um, what, and, and I like that a lot. I'm glad you mentioned that. What I meant specifically here is when you tell someone they're doing a good job verbally, but nonverbally, it's just obvious they think you're not doing a good job. Or you tell someone, okay, that's not a big deal. We can smooth that over. But it's just obvious they're just like seething inside. Okay. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to interact with that person. You don't trust them. You don't, you don't know whether or not they're mad. You don't know how to respond to them. Uh, a person who is self-aware has awareness of strengths, needs, weaknesses. So this is important. Let's go through each of those. Needs. So if you're not aware of your needs, does that mean you don't have needs? just means you're not aware of your needs. So you might express them in unhealthy ways. If you're aware also of your strengths and your weakness, weaknesses, you can know how you can contribute to a team. You can know how you can help and support your subordinates. But if you're not aware of those things, sometimes you can do unhealthy things as it relates to your interpersonal interactions. You might be trying to prove that you're strong where you're actually weak. You might be upset that you're weak in an area and not want to admit that to yourself. And that could just cause you to have this frustration when you interact with people. So self-awareness is not just about understanding our emotions, but understanding how we fit in a social professional context. Uh, awareness of values and goals. Same question I posed with needs. If you're not aware of your values and goals, that doesn't mean you don't have values and goals. You're still going to have aspirations. You're still going to have things that you feel comfortable with and uncomfortable with. And if you're able to acknowledge when you're uncomfortable in a certain situation, you're going to be able to interact with people in a way that deals with that in a healthy, positive way. If for some reason you're in a situation that makes you uncomfortable, but you just don't have the awareness to acknowledge that and aware that it's going on, then that could cause some problems for you. And with all that understanding comes self-acceptance and confidence. You may not be strong at everything, but you can accept where you are. You can accept what you're working towards. You want to be on a team with someone who has self-acceptance and is confident about where they are. You don't want to be on a team with someone who is constantly underestimating or misestimating their own skills and abilities. And as a result, it's just not self-assured. So you want to be the person who understands your strengths, weaknesses, emotions, emotional effects. <laughs> So you can interact with people in a more positive way. Uh, emotional management. So if you have skills in emotional management, what do you have? Well, the first thing you have is rational thought. You can think rationally when you're not controlled by your emotions. And this is key. Right? This, is, this is a really big point. If you get frustrated and you do things irrationally, then you know, that's not going to be very that's not going to be very positive for you in the long term. And we don't really think about this on a minor scale. We might think about this on a large scale. When you say that time I just got so mad, I just you know indirectly called someone a bitch, or I got so mad, I just did this or that. You think about those extreme scenarios, but you don't think about those little things when you just got frustrated with the IT department and you just kind of gave them attitude when they finally showed up. You're like, well, that wasn't really rational. I just was mad, so I, so I did it. It wasn't like I panicked or scared for my life. There's so many times we get in just these small frustrating moments 
and we do something that's emotional rather than rational. Rational thought. That's what we have. We have emotional magic. Resiliency, I'm going to put these next few up and talk about them all as group. Resiliency, patience, flexibility. So this is the idea that if things don't go exactly your way, are you going to fly off the handle emotionally and say, I can't change course, I can't be flexible? If you get some disappointment, are you going to say, well, I'm just going to stew for the rest of the summer? I didn't get that job that I wanted, so I know that my life can't ever be perfect. It can only be kind of perfect. Or are you going to have some resiliency and say, I can bounce back from this? Some flexibility, say, I can change course even though I disagree with the way my team is doing this? And some patience, knowing that even though I didn't get that thing I wanted right now, I can manage that emotion and work in positive ways to get what I want in the future. Emotional management, resiliency, patience, flexibility, confidence. All right, we said confidence with self-awareness. I'll say confidence with emotional management as well. If you can confidently walk into a difficult situation such as a business presentation and know it may not go perfectly, but know that you're going to be calm and you're going to be able to be resilient and patient no matter what happens, that's going to give you a sense of confidence. Knowing that you can imagine, you can manage your emotions when you need to. Uh, Self-motivation. I put self-motivation under emotional management. The reason I do is because I make the argument that we all have aspirations. We all are motivated to do certain things. We all have goals. And what prevents us from accomplishing those goals, or what presents us, prevents us from trying to accomplish those goals, is that we get frustrated. Frustrated, we say, I'm not going to try anymore. Right? It didn't work out, so I'm not going to be resilient. I'm not going to be patient. I'm not going to be flexible. So it saps our motivation. Because we get into all these problems where frustration stops us from doing something that we found important, we found worthwhile. So I like to look at motivation as a component of emotional management. All right, and failing to manage our emotions can sap our motivation. Uh, lastly, physical and mental health. You're stressed out all the time. I mentioned earlier that's not going to hurt the person usually that's stressing you out. Or the person that's doing the thing that's upsetting you, it's going to hurt you. Your heart's going to be beating all the time. You have all the stress in your body, brick neck, whatever the case may be. If you can manage those emotions, you can avoid a lot of those problems. Okay, lastly, social management. If you have the ability to actively manage your social interactions, what do you have? First thing, empathy. We talked about empathy earlier. The ability to put yourself in someone's shoes. This helps us with so many interactions. So many of the worst managers we did, we've ever had just had no idea what we were going through. They had no idea what we were feeling and how they could help us because they lacked emotional intelligence. They lacked the ability to think from our perspective. And we can all think of examples of just how great it is when someone understands us. When someone says, yeah, I understand what you're going through, and I want to help you with that, rather than do this, do that, or don't do this, don't do that. Empathy. Insight. So with empathy gives us insight. If we can think about what someone's going through, we can judge their motivations. We can say, all right, my manager is probably feeling really stressed out right now, and that's why she's screaming at this person or that person or me. So I want to think about that in my response. I don't want to just think about the fact that she's screaming at me. I want to think about why and how I can be insightful about that. And then lastly, if you have social management, you have an ability to relate to people. Combine this empathy, combine this insight, and you can relate. Understand what you're going through. I can change my behavior based on your emotions. I can change my approach based on where you're standing. I can change my ability to, to be a subordinate of yours based on what you're going through right now. Okay, so a broad view, self-awareness, emotional management, social management. Now I'd like to look at series of actual events that you may have encountered, that you may have thought of, 
and I want to think about how these events fit in with emotional intelligence and what broad category of emotional intelligence skill we can put them in. I took these EQ questions from a very long emotional intelligence uh, test, longer than the one that you all took this weekend. And these are just various scenarios that you might have faced in your life. Let's look at each of them. Think about, is the person engaging in this behavior someone with high emotional intelligence or low emotional intelligence? And what category does it fit in? Self-awareness, emotional management, or social management? So this person might tell you that I change my tone and behavior depending on who I am interacting with. Is that a person high EQ or low EQ? High. High. All right. And which of the three categories would we put this in? Social management. Okay, good, good, all right. So that's what I want to do to think this through. The more we have a, an ability to analyze this in a practical, tangible way, the more we can take this soft emotional management idea and think about it in terms of specific applications for us. So this person might tell you, I change my beliefs and values depending on who I am interacting with. Let me get uh, one person for each. So if you want to take this one, raise your hand. I change my beliefs and values depending on who I am interacting with. Yep. Self-awareness. Oh, is, 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 is it low? Low? Okay. Low and self-awareness. That's what I would say. Now, there's no, some of these, we could argue, some self-awareness, some emotional management, so, some social management, but I would say this one is self-awareness. Jim. <laughs> yeah. Because basically, like, so in terms of business situations, uh, say you're interested in investing in some like one building project, and you're going to do a bunch of deposits, and everybody else is going to just have to pay it down. Like, say, like, you're in Yale, and it's just out, and like, like something greater than that. It's almost easier just to say no and to get your money back and to learn the value of it. Like, you have nothing to gain from asserting yourself. Great point. So might you in that situation change your tone and behavior? Well, you wouldn't be letting them know that you're not giving them that information. Yeah, so you so you change your behavior by not sharing that information, not just throwing it in their face. And changing your tone when you say, you know, you know, when you talk about Donald Trump, when you say, you know, if your tone normally might be just some, you know, fit of rage, it might be, okay, he's tapped into anger that American people are feeling, and I can respect that. That could be true, even though you can't stand the guy. Well, what I would say is in that situation, I would change your tone and behavior. I, I would not, when you're in New York, tell people you're a Democrat, and then when you you know, take your team down to wherever, tell them that you're a Republican. I would not change your beliefs and values to that extreme. Would you want to be on a team with someone who, depending on where they are, believes one thing versus the other? Okay. Yeah. Change tone and behavior, but you know, you don't want to change beliefs and values. That's, that's not someone that has high emotional intelligence, not someone that you trust. If necessary, I can be courteous to a person I dislike. Uh, raise your hand if you want to. Michelle. Uh, yeah, emotional management. Yeah, I would say emotional management, a little social management as well. And Yes, my, uh, David, sorry. Yeah, um, emotional and social management, it's low. Always be courteous to people you, you don't dislike. Not if necessary. In business, it's always necessary. Okay. When when was there an opportunity for you to be rude to somebody and, and advance your objective? Good point. Okay. 
So, so, so this, but this person has high emotional intelligence, but you would also say that this person should always be nice. Maybe I should just change that question. I can be courteous to a person I dislike. I am courteous to people I dislike. I am courteous to people I dislike. Fair enough. Good. Good point. I avoid difficult conversations even if having those conversations is necessary and important. Ricky. Uh, is, it, is it high or low? High. High. Okay. Wait. Okay. I avoid, it's high in which... Uh, Which, which, which of the three categories would you put it in? Oh, social management. Okay. All right. So Ricky says, hi, social management. Someone want to take the contrarian point, Jameson? Yeah, so the key here is necessary and important. <coughs> it's necessary. It's impeding your business somehow if you don't have it, impeding your relationship somehow. You're, you're mad about something, and if you don't express that in a healthy way, you might express that in an unhealthy way. So this person, I would say, is low EQ. What do you think, Ricky? Yeah. And converted, well... Okay, so so did you need to fire them in the morning, or because no, it's okay if you wait till fire them at night? I drive them in the morning. I drive them in the morning. Okay, so it would have been better if you'd done it in the morning. I think so. I think the morning would be a better time to do this because you're not in that bed. Okay, all right. So I, I feel like you just told me that it was important that you do it in the morning, mm -hmm. and it would have been better from a business standpoint. And it's a bad thing that you waited. Okay. Are you with me there then? All right. I am, I avoid difficult conversations, even if they're necessary and important. We're going to call that a low EQ person. Kind of like you were a little bit today. I'm sure you're not, I'm sure you're not low EQ all the time. <laughs> but you, this, this is something you should have had in the morning and would have been better if you'd had in the morning. Because it was necessary. All right, all right. So we'll move on, and we can come back to that when it's necessary. Uh, when I become occupied with a negative thought, I cannot concentrate on anything else until it is resolved. Mike. You said low emotional intelligence. Yes, that's what I would say. Any any other thoughts on that? What's that? What? That one hits home. Hits home. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, when I come involved with a negative thought, I can't concentrate on anything else until it's resolved. All right, so we're going to have things that frustrate us, and if we let that occupy all our space and our emotional capacity, if we let that impede our other relationships, our other work we have to do, then that's going to hurt us. And we want to think about a way to manage that emotion. When things get bad, I like to look at the bright side. Jose? Okay. Yeah, that's what I would say. So I would say this is a high EQ person, looking at the bright side. Now, to be honest with you, this type of person always used to annoy me. The person who would always say, well, at least the car is kind of, you know, only partly on fire. Or at least, you know, we've only been lost a few hours. You know, or at least we'll get back, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. I felt sometimes that I wanted to be mad. Uh, help me out, Saeed. Why, why was, what was the error in my thinking? <laughs> well, I have a scenario, we have a scenario at work where we have, like, when we do have big problems, right, so we have a guy that's always like, no, no, it wasn't that bad, and it's not a good thing, it's like, no, it was terrible, we need to figure out a solution for this now, and he's always looking at the bright side, and so, 
That's actually a really terrible thing to do. That's the reason why he hasn't approached his new manager uh -huh. because he doesn't know how when things are bad to realize that they're bad and then deal with them. He's always looking to the bright side. So, you know, I know it's good like to have, be positive and not the bad, but sometimes you need to just face the bad and not be positive <coughs> about it and be positive that maybe you can make it better next time. Yeah, well, let's look at that particular person. So, so might that person be able to say, all right, this is tough and we absolutely need to change it right now. But, you know, this can be positive. We will learn from this experience. We will deliver a better service once we make this change. In fact, I'm glad this came up. I wish it hadn't come up while we were in the middle of this other stuff, but, you know, that will teach us to manage things. Could, could that guy be that person instead? I could be sure all the time, <laughs> but not when the problem is. Uh, okay. You know, once you've resolved the problem, then you say, well, looking back at that, the bright side was that. At least we discovered the problem before it could have gotten worse. Okay, all right, let's, let's get some other thoughts here. Shruti. Um, so, why are we using the other emotional factors? Something that, you know, starts to move, people, people like that, they just feel like they can't handle the process of just constantly looking for positivity and, like, sometimes things are bad. Okay, okay, okay. Evan? So finding good things doesn't mean you're ignoring the bad as well. I'm, I'm kind of this guy too, but I totally acknowledge the reality of the situation. Yeah, it sucks, but on the bright side, we know what's going on. It doesn't mean you can ignore the situation. No, you can't act. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're using bright side as an excuse for inaction, that's that's a bad thing to steal. But, or if you're using it to the reality of the situation is that it's bad, but there's nothing wrong with you know, finding something positive to, to get you going. Because if something was really bad, oftentimes people would just stop and not do anything to you. So they're frozen in that moment. They see the badness of the situation, um, which is, in my opinion, worse. But still, if that person is frozen, and the person who says, oh, this is okay, but like, you go off and you on fire and say, it's fine. Like, it's, those are both equally bad. Right. I, I I like the way you said that. Using you know the fact that by calling it a bright side is an excuse for inaction, that's bad. But just because you're looking on the bright side doesn't mean you say this is bad and we need to fix it right right now. Okay. Yeah, likewise, um, people rarely make good decisions during panic. So saying that you know if everything's bad, even if something's going wrong, acknowledging that it's wrong. Figuring out what parts of it are good, or how it could be better, or how, hey, once we fix this problem, this will solve, you know, these other three things, and this will, this will be great. Glad this broke now. Um, you have to be somewhat optimistic in order to get people to move along and engage. People only fight fires for so long before they get burnt out and move on. Yeah, great points. I like it. Daniel? Yeah. But if the outcome is, all right, well, it's not going to, we can, we can work through this, and so the outcome of whatever you said is uplifting or is in favor of what's around you, then you're optimistic about it. So that goes into the mindset of being positive. Yeah. A person with high, I, high EQ, it doesn't mean they're nice all the time. It doesn't mean they're in a good mood all the time. It doesn't mean they're always saying everything is <coughs> perfect. It just means they're able to find ways to be flexible and resilient even when things are bad. And Dave made a good point. People rarely make good decisions when they're panicked. So if you can think about, all right, how this is not terrible, this is not necessarily reason to panic, will put me in a better position to make a good decision. I've gone through a number of career transitions in, in my career. I mentioned a little bit about my story 
in the first class. I was doing acting years and years ago, and then I went to business school and was doing finance, and now I'm, and then I started my communications consulting business, and I do things like this. Now, if those first two those first two careers didn't work out the way I wanted them to, you know, then unfortunately they decided they liked Brad Pitt better than me. I don't know why, <laughs> but my acting career didn't work out, and then finance <laughs> didn't did, didn't work out uh, the way I planned either. If I just stewed and said, man, you know, this is what I want, this is my dream, there's never going to be anything that's going to make me happy besides that, then I feel that really would have hurt my development. And, and the truth is, I did spend time in each of those thinking about this really sucks and this is really bad. But those were not times that helped me move forward. The times that helped me move forward where I thought, like, how can I use this as leverage? How can I create something positive? Or uh, uh, Nick. Yeah, I was just gonna say to your point. Uh, in this scenario, I think that people who are leaders generally, or good leaders, will have these traits. And it's like kind of wallowing and acknowledging a bad situation doesn't go anywhere. Right? It's like it's like well, you know, maybe you need some, you need some you know, like way out or the how you see the bigger picture. Great, fantastic. Uh, let's move on. I am good at expressing my emotions and telling people how I feel. Okay, which which category? <laughs> okay, I would say high EQ, and I would probably say self awareness, understanding your emotions, and expressing it. It could be a little bit social management as well, how you express. Maybe if you're angry, how you express that in a socially acceptable way. Yeah. I was going to say, I think this could fall um, either or. For example, um, you could be at home in here and say everything you want to say that day, or plan out what you're going to say, and say it how you want to say it. But when mm -hmm. you get into that social situation, mm -hmm. you have your boss or someone looking, uh -huh. you kind of crumble. Uh -huh. I think this is this could be self-aware, but I think it's also when you're when you're back here in front of your people. Great point. Great, great point. So you have a way you feel, you're self-aware of it, but when you get on the ground and try to have that conversation, it crumbles. So you need to think about how you can manage your emotions when you're having that interaction. And think about how you can say things in a socially acceptable way. I've, I've had a lot of practice in my career saying difficult things in a socially acceptable way. I did sales for a while. I had to be blunt sometimes. It managed to... Uh, you know, uh, people who were not used to being managed, so I thought about ways to honestly say th important things to them. And, you know, just uh, I mentioned last time that uh, I, I dislike it when people tell me something that's not true. I dislike it when people lie to me. And I've always thought about how can I make what I say absolutely true and say it in a way that I'm not going to crumble when I start looking them in the eye and try to say that. So that that is a great point, Nick. Thank you. Uh, any other questions about that? Let's move. If I'm angry at someone, I need to immediately tell them how I feel. Loving you. Listening. I'd say low. And I put these two together because I feel like this is positive. This is not necessarily positive. The second one, if I'm angry, I need to immediately tell them. Well, maybe you're not ready to have that conversation. Maybe you haven't thought through what they're going through. Maybe you haven't thought through the best way to approach it. And if you just have to, you just have to frustrate, and you have to express that frustration right away, then you could be hurting yourself. Hmm. I say things that I regret. Low uh, self-awareness. Yeah, low. I would definitely say low. Um, I would lean away from self-awareness on this, and I would put it in a different category. Does anyone want to guess what I'm thinking? Emotional, I would call it emotional management. So this is the idea where we are frustrated and we just say something without being able to manage that emotion, without being able to take a breath and say, maybe I shouldn't say that right now. I often think about the ethical implications of my actions. 
Mike. Hi, Solomon. Uh, I would say hi. Um, I, would say, I wouldn't say self-awareness so much for this one. I would say another one. You, I, could, I could be open to the argument of self-awareness, but I think there's a valuable takeaway on this one for social management. All right, ethical, act, ethical implications gets us thinking about how what we do will affect other people. And when we make a practice of stopping to think about that, we are able to naturally put ourselves in their shoes and think about way we could, ways we could interact with them that will draw us to them or draw them to us. I like to keep trying at worthwhile things, even if I get frustrated at first. Hi. I could argue self-awareness. I could see another case. Shruti? I, I would say high and emotional management. <coughs> I get frustrated. Ooh, I got a splinter. Now I'm going to give up my hobby of doing this just because I got one splinter. All right? that's, that's an emotional reaction, getting that piece of wood in your finger. If you're able to get past that and manage that emotion, you keep trying worthwhile things. Uh, my friends and family members sometimes make offhand remarks that I find intensely annoying. Uh, anyone? Ricky. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I, tell, tell me why this person is a high EQ person. Friends and family sometimes make remarks, offhand remarks, that I find intensely annoying. You think that's a high EQ person? Sorry, no. Okay, no. all right, sorry, sorry. Okay. okay, sorry, you're looking at me like, oh my god, what? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Jameson? So, part of something that's missing in the audience that makes you go, I mean, in this case, you know, are we assuming the person doesn't say anything back? Or just kind of control? Or is it, I would say, being able to be calm and collected and not respond or have a sort of ability to report to you when you see you're in a problem can make you a high EQ person. Okay, so, so not responding, that's, that's another thing. I think that's great. Let me just take a breath, not talk to them now, understand where they're coming from. They're just looking at me like I'm 10 years old, like they you know, have for the last 30 years. That is a high EQ person. But let's just talk about this. Someone makes an offhand remark, and you get intensely annoyed by that. 80% of your day is that. All right, well, how, how much control do you have over the comments that your friends and family make? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to agree with you that not responding is an important thing, but is, is, is there a way when you go on family vacations where you could not sit and stew and be intensely annoyed by using some of the skills we've talked about so far? Or are just all your family vacation, vacations from this point forward, you're just doomed to being intensely annoyed? <laughs> Could you maybe say, well, I understand, mom's, you know, her memory's not getting so, it's not great, so maybe she's just saying that because she's remembering that time I wet my pants in, uh, in elementary school. So I'm not going to get annoyed by that. I, I think you can make the decision to do that. All right, someone want to help me out here? Nick. I would say it's low emotional management. I think it, to your point, it's, it's, you can choose to let all choose to be um, not intensely annoyed by it, which would be, I think, the opposite of high emotional management. That, that's the argument I would make. I'm open to discussing, but that is the argument that I would make. Right, so, so low emotional high emotional. What, uh, <laughs> high, <laughs> wait, wait, well, you're talking about the, the next step, but I'm going to argue on the next step. The next step is you don't respond. We agree on that. But I, I want to stay on just, you, did, you don't have to sit and be intensely annoyed. You can think about, well, that's just, you know, her perspective or his perspective. Or, you know, she's just mad about her divorce. That's why she's, taking, that's why she's asking me why I'm not married. You know, that's, that's, that I can empathize with what she's feeling and why she's saying that. Yes. 
Yes, and we'll do some exercises later where we'll think about what are we going to react to and what are we not going to react to. So what situations do we have to be careful about <coughs> walking into? Where is our chance of going to emotional hijack high? Great point. All right, let's, let's keep moving. Uh, uh, I can tell when someone I'm talking to gets nervous and I do my best to make them feel relaxed. Love it. High social measures. High social measures. I have noticed that I have compulsive habits, like biting nails or overeating, but I don't know why I have them and I cannot seem to stop them. I don't know why I have them and I cannot seem to stop them. Low self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want these habits. You're like, why do, why do I shake when I walk <laughs> into this boardroom? You know, I don't know why that happens. You know, this boardroom where everyone yells at me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I want to understand what's going on, why I have that nervous habit, and how I can deal with that in a healthy way. I'm aware of which types of professional and social situations make me feel uncomfortable. So this is a high EQ person, and this is this awareness that Vishali was talking about that we're going to get to in a minute. Think about what situations are dangerous for us that we need to prepare ourselves for for a possible emotional hijack. I insist on doing things my way. I would say low social management. I would agree with that. I know there's some nuances we can get into, the people who are real get go-getters and get things done, but we, we could have a long discussion about how you need to be careful about that. And if you can't do things your way all the time, you need to show some flexibility and resilience. Uh, <laughs> try to ignore negative feelings. Same thing we talked about, why you're handshaking when you always walk into the boardroom. I would say this is a low... EQ, self, low self-awareness. If you, if you ignore negative feelings, that doesn't mean they go away. It just means you deal with them in an unhealthy way. Uh, I think people have selfish or bad intentions. I think people usually have selfish or bad intentions. Uh, who, who, who said something? I heard something. Drew. Sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. But do, do people usually have selfish or bad intentions? I, I would argue not nearly as much as we think they do. They're just going through a rough day. Their boss just yelled at them. That's why they're yelling at us. And it's not that they're a bad person. I mean, I may not like their management style. But there's something going on that I could potentially empathize with that would help me relate to that person more effectively. Uh, okay, let's uh, move, skip that one. I'm just going to move on to the next section. Uh, I practice activities that help me understand my feelings, such as keeping a diary, talking with friends. I, I'd say self-awareness. I find it hard to be patient. I would say low and emotional management. Okay, so... The thing, the number one thing that Daniel Goleman called the enemy of high emotional intelligence was what he called the emotional hijack. This is none other than the panic situation we sometimes get into, the fight, flight, or freeze reaction. We walk into a boardroom. We start giving a presentation. Someone asks us a really annoying question. We just freeze. And we lose rational thought in that moment. We lose our ability to consider multiple variables. We sometimes think of that person who's asking an annoying question as a physical threat to our life, our well-being. We go into this adrenaline response where we're prepared for a life or death confrontation. And, and what happens is we're preparing for that and we're less prepared to deal with social and professional situations in a civilized environment. So this fight, flight, or freeze reaction that happens, I want to ask you a question. When is this a good thing, and when might this be a bad thing? Sure thing. Yeah, of course. 
of course, when the car is coming at you, yeah, do, do not try to think about what I taught you in this class. Just jump out of the way. <laughs> when, when your life is in danger, this is a good thing. This is a very good thing. Daniel? Yes, so your life is in danger, this is a good thing. You get asked an annoying question, this is a bad thing. And I would make the point that an emotional hijack is only good when your life is in danger. Right? That adrenaline running through your body, that lack of ability to consider multiple variables, that panic feeling, is not something that is ever going to work for you when you're trying to conduct yourself in an effective communication, professional, social type of environment. I have heard the argument that just a little bit of stress keeps you on edge. I could, we could debate that. But for the most part, this fight, flight, or freeze is not something we want to have controlling our professional lives. It's a good, when it's a bad, the adrenaline goes through our body, oxygen utilizes the response. Sometimes it's hard to talk because the oxygen is trying to prepare our muscles. Something we'll talk about, the amygdala, amygdala compromises our working memory. And the duration of this emotional hijack varies. I've got a graphic where we can think about this emotional hijack works physiologically. Suppose you are this hiker. You're walking along, enjoying a nice fall day, enjoying, enjoying a nice spring day. And all of a sudden, you see a snake. And you scream. Ah! So what happens inside your brain. You see the snake. That information is transferred to something called the visual thalamus, where your mind says, oh, that's a snake. That information is then passed on to the cerebral cortex, where you process, oh, a snake. The best thing for me to do in this situation is to carefully step back, slowly walk away. You transfer that information to something called your amygdala, which is a processing center, which transfers that information down your spine, which says, slowly walk back. Now, if any of you are, uh, have a healthcare background, uh, I may have realized this is a simplified diagram that Daniel Goldman presented us with, but it has stood up to scrutiny about the big picture of what happens. There is also something that happens at the same time. When you see this snake, you see this little dotted line? What's going on there? From the visual thalamus to the amygdala. Exactly. It's, by, it's bypassing the rational part of your brain, the cerebral part of your brain. Who never heard uh, someone say that you're very cerebral? You think things through. Carefully. Cerebral is the thinking part of our brain, where we make those rational decisions. And it takes a split second longer to go through the cerebral part of our brain than it does to go straight to the amygdala and jump out of the way when the car is coming at us. But when we do that, we're losing rational thought. And we don't want to lose rational thought unless our life is literally in danger. Maybe sometimes when our life is in danger, we still want to have rational thought. Yeah. Okay. So this emotional hijack, it can last a while. Unless we recognize a threat as something that is not threatening our life, then we can stay in that panic situation indefinitely. Our compromised working memory, I mentioned this earlier, The uh, this... Institute for Health and Human Potential has done some research on it, and they've concluded that your compromised working memory, which means that it's harder for you to process multiple variables because you're so focused on the one thing that is, that is posing a threat to your life, 
it's hard for you to say, oh, well, that thing relates to this, which if I just call th these people, they'll answer this question and get it resolved. It's hard for you to make that second and third connection when you're in this emotional hijack situation. And that sometimes can last up to 18 minutes after the interaction. Has anyone, anyone had the experience where maybe you're in a job interview or you ask a tough question during a presentation and you say you don't know the answer and then you walk out, you're getting in your car, oh man, I knew the answer to that. I should have just said this. Compromised working memory may last 18 minutes. Physical toxicity, this adrenaline that runs through your body lasts three to four hours. So at the end of the day, you're like, man, I need a drink. Go and relax and unwind because I'm like so stressed out from that interaction, even though it happened three or four hours ago. Uh, emotional distress from this situation could last forever. If you have a bad experience with the people in the copy room and they just send you into an emotional hijack, you might for the next 20 years while you're working on that company never want to go down and talk to them again. And I guarantee you that's not going to upset the people in the copy room. It's only going to hurt you. All right, so how do we improve our emotional intelligence? How do we avoid emotional hijack? How do we get better self-awareness? How do we get better emotional management? Well, it comes down to an analysis, exactly what we're doing now, thinking about how real-life situations can apply to the stuff we're learning, what sort of techniques we can use to engage in better social management, better emotional management, how we can build our self-awareness, and practice, which is what we'll do next week. We'll create some difficult question scenarios, difficult conversation scenarios, and think about how we can use some of these techniques. All right, what we're doing today is the analysis, and I'm gonna show you a few techniques. First technique I wanna show you, how we can avoid emotional hijack. And I noticed on the printout too that this one didn't come out as much, so maybe you wanna write this down because I made this up myself. <laughs> this, is, this is mine. And it didn't even come out on the printout. The triple B method for stopping an emotional hijack. One, break the pattern. Two, buy time. Three, build context. So break the pattern, and we've got this adrenaline going through our body. We've got our heart beating to prepare us for this life or death. How can we stop that? Well, we can breathe. Heard that a lot. It's not pointless advice. Breathing slows down your heart rate slows down that adrenaline response. It actually works. It may not feel like it works because you're really stressed out, but at least you're not completely panicked. Second thing we can do by time. Let's not make decisions in that 18 minutes where a compromised working memory is occurring. Let's, let's hold off. Let's say let's revisit this in 19 minutes. Now let me think about that question. I'll get back to you at the end of this slide. Or, you know, we're coming up to that issue. Let me, let me get to the next topic, and then, and then we'll talk about that. Ask for time. Take time. Avoid commitments. And build context. What I mean by this is think about, is my life really in danger? If it is, then I better be in an emotional panic situation, and I better get out of the way. If it's not, I need to think about what's the true context here. Is this a threat? No, it's not. Well, it's a threat, but it's a threat socially, it's a threat professionally, it's not something that I need an emotional hijack to help me out with. Ask questions, engage that cerebral cortex. What's going on here? Does this person really want to get me fired or are they just trying to clarify? I think they're trying to clarify. Count backwards from 100 by three. It just takes a, just a tiny bit of rational thought to get you more into your cerebral con cortex. 100, 97, 94, 91, 88. <laughs> so you can't do it automatically. You have to, to slow down. Let me, let me do that for just 10 seconds before I walk into this meeting. Okay, triple B method for stopping an emotional hijack. Now we're going to look at some self-awareness. What time are we at? Let's, let's get just a little bit into this self-awareness and in the midst of this we will take a break and, and give you a chance to fill out some of these answers. This is 
chance to think about. All right, this is a chance for us to think about what might be causing us to act in low EQ ways and how we could avoid this. And I've asked you to complete this between now and next week and submit this as homework, but I'd like to just get started so we have a chance to brainstorm and think about some best practices in terms of how to approach this. So what I would like to do is I'm gonna I'm gonna direct your attention to yes, I'm gonna direct your attention to the third page, which is Emotional Hijack Trigger Worksheet. And I would like to ask you to think of some past events that have triggered an emotional hijack. And this is not an event where your physical well-being was actually threatened. This was an event where you were scared and it wasn't necessarily helpful. So that time you got mugged in Detroit, don't, don't, don't put that one down. Put the time where you got nervous and stressed and it compromised your ability to communicate. And then I have the first question, any actual threat to your physical well-being? And the answer to that is going to be no, because if it's yes, you should be looking at it in a different context. I just put that there to remind you, your physical well-being was not in jeopardy. But you did feel threatened for whatever reason. Maybe you felt threatened socially, professionally, financially. Think about why you felt threatened. And then lastly, how might you describe this category of event? And the more you can describe categories of events that cause you emotional hijack tendencies, the more you can be aware and prepare for those events and think about using some of these techniques to overcome them. So I would like you to just spend a couple minutes doing that. And... I want to draw your attention to the previous page, and that is professional goal worksheet. And you don't need to in-depthly put in your goals right now, but I mention that because I just want to think about your professional goals and how they might be compromised by emotional hijack situations that you have encountered. Because if you encounter an emotional hijack situation and it doesn't really hurt you, doesn't really matter to you, then... You know, that's not going to be as important to your professional success. Let's think strategically like Daniel Goleman did and say, what is your goal in terms of your effective job performance? What are you trying to accomplish? And what are three events that triggered emotional hijacks that led to a compromise in your ability to do that? So think for like, 30 seconds about your professional goals. Maybe jot them down if you want to, just put them in context. And then let's think about three events that triggered an emotional hijack in the past. And let's take, where's the day? Let's take, uh, let's take about 15 minutes and combine that if you need to take a break, if you need to stretch your legs, whatever. Let's come back together at 7.40, Two, and, uh, and we'll think about three events in your past that triggered an emotional hijack. Any questions before I send you off to do that? Okay, fantastic. So we'll come back together in 15 minutes and we'll discuss past events.